Welcome everyone. Uh, today we're very happy to have Matt uh, going, he's going to tell us about supersymmetric black holes, defects, and phase transition. Thank you. So um, I guess by this point, most people in the room know who I am. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for giving me the chance to speak. And um, so I guess this is my last talk here as a member at IAS. Um, so I wanted to just briefly at the beginning, uh, take this time to uh, also sort of thank everyone uh, who I've interacted with, who I've discussed with um, for you know, discussions, interactions, and collaborations. Um, it's been an interesting past few years here at IAS. And, um, so the, the, the goal of this talk is to review a little bit about um, the black hole microstate counting program and uh, some of my uh, research activity in that area, um, as well as, uh, so, so I'll do a little bit of review. I'll do a little bit of review of some previous papers I've written here. And then in the latter half of the talk, I'm gonna focus on a new uh, work, um, which will appear hopefully uh, this month, Maybe, maybe even in a few weeks or a week, we'll see. Um, but uh, so there'll be some old stuff, some review, and then some uh, new proposals, um, which it all fits together. So, okay, with that, let's start. Uh, so our general motivation in this talk in very broad terms is that we'd like to think of black holes as ordinary quantum systems. Um, and I think that uh, before the work in string theory that showed that maybe this is a reasonable proposal, I'm not exactly sure if this is a, supposed to be a conservative or, or radical proposal. In some sense, we really think that the ordinary rules of quantum mechanics should apply even in situations where we have black holes. So in that sense, this is, this is a, a conservative proposal. But I think that the, the, the radical part is trying to make this actually work in practice. Um, and part of the reason why this is hard is that we don't really know the rules of the gravitational path interval. So in this talk, I'll be focused on black holes that live in asymptotically ADS spacetimes. And by the ADS CFT correspondence, we know that, say, the partition function of the conformal field theory on some manifold with some background fields turned on should be equivalent to the partition function or the path integral of uh, the gravitational system with the same boundary values of those fields. So the boundary value of the metric and boundary values of background fields. So if we believe ADS CFT, we know this should be true. And the bulk side contains black holes. But the problem is that, let's say we can specify a specific partition function, like the thermal partition function, where beta will label the inverse temperature. And this has some microscopic definition in terms of ordinary uh, field theory quantities, we say put the conformal field theory on a, on a spatial sphere and consider the Hilbert space of the conformal field theory on that sphere. We take the trace of the Hilbert space, weight by e to the minus beta h. That's a familiar formula. The problem is that on the gravity side, we don't really have an analogous, uh, uh, a good definition of the trace in the most general examples. Possibly in some 2D theories, uh, we might be able to define a trace. But in general, in the bulk, we only have some sort of semi-classical effective field theory uh, in, in the most, most general cases. So, so in general, we'll, we'll only understand the semi-classical effective field theory, and we can try to approximate the, the gravitational path integral, the Feynman path integral over the fluctuating degrees of freedom in the bulk. We can approximate it by saddle point. So that zeta beta will be approximated by some sum over saddles of the exponential of the classical action weighted by some one loop corrections. Of course, this is not the only thing that could show up on the right hand side. So, so the picture would be that we fix some boundary values for the, for the metric and various background fields, and then we consider various geometries that fill in that uh, fill in the interior. But it could be that there are other things contributing to the sum that don't have some interpretation in terms of smooth ge geometry. Uh, we might need to consider sums over many geometries or perturbative fluctuations and stringy corrections and even non-perturbative corrections. So string theory gives us some idea of what we're supposed to put on the right-hand side, but I think uh, part of the, the moral of this is that uh, we don't really know the rules here in the book. And so luckily, because of ads -CFT, we can use this more microscopic definition of some quantity we want to compute to try to compare with this sort of a, a approximation and to try to see what we need to include on this. So that's the setup. So just a few remarks. I want to just say a few things. This is not meant to be a discussion of this. I just wanted to say some things that I'm not trying to claim. We can revisit these later uh, if people want to discuss it. 
Um, so I'm not saying that in this Euclidean calculation that individual CFT microstates are necessarily dual to these Euclidean black hole sets. I'm not necessarily saying that's true. It might be that the thing that we call a black hole as the solution of Einstein's equations may only be some kind of statistical distribution. So I'm not, I'm not making claims of matching individual microstates on the nodes and what I'm saying here, even if that might ultimately be true. Um, I'm also, when I say that a black hole is sort of an ordinary quantum system, I mean that it should have a unitary evolution, it should have some uh, discrete spectrum, uh, and I should be able to partition the system into subsystems if I like. But in gravity, it's not necessarily the case there's always a clear distinction between the black hole and its environment. And in, from this dual CFT point of view, this is not always even natural. Um, I'm also not saying that all we need to do is sum over ordinary smooth solutions of Einstein equations or smooth metric, metric configurations. I'm not saying that's all that's required to define a theory of quantum gravity. As I said before, in general, we might need to include other kinds of ingredients that might be very stringy in origin uh, and or other things that we haven't even encountered yet. So, so, of course, a sum over smooth geometries probably should be part of the answer, but it might not be the complete. Uh, but I'm also not claiming that you know, these sort of special protected supersymmetric observables computed in Euclidean field theory via some analytic continuation. I'm not saying that, that, that this is the only, with this class of observable, this is the only thing that we should be trying to compare between uh, uh, conformal field theory and gravity. It's just the ones where we really uh, know how to do a detailed check on the field theory side, where we have some better understanding. But of course, we should be trying to learn more general lessons from these kinds of observables and extend the regime of what we're willing to talk about. So we want to understand the bulk microstates in terms of the bulk variables, ultimately. Although that won't really be covered here, but that's the, the plan. Okay, so let me really briefly review the microstate counting and string theory. So since this work of Strom and Dravata, it's been known that, especially in CFT2 context, there are reliable quantities like the elliptic genus or the superconformal index, which you can compute a weak coupling and they're independent of the coupling. So you can extrapolate them to from the regime where say some bound states of D brains are a good description to a regime where uh, the, so the bulk ADS physics and the bulk uh, quantum gravity physics including black holes becomes important. Um, so, so this is a cartoon of the kind of thing that we're gonna be describing. So instead of considering this ordinary thermal partition function, when the theory has additional global symmetries and supersymmetry, we can choose some combination of the chemical potentials to create a minus one to the F in the partition function. So this is this superconformal index here, written as a 2D quantity, as a trace in the NS sector, is some protected quantity, uh, and it's protected due to the arguments given by Edward in his supersymmetry and Morse theory paper and, and related. So the idea is that this, is independent of the coupling, it'll also end up being independent of the temperature, which is uh, will be important later. And this is the 2D version. So the argument goes that you compute this by some free field counting uh, and, um, and it's some sort of Q series. You then apply the Cardi formula um, and the Cardi formula will pull out some prefactor. That prefactor is related to the large end growth of the black hole entropy. And, um, you can do a little better, for instance, in, in this work, you can try to write this exact formula as some kind of sum over bulk geometries. So the idea is from studying these 2D theories where we have a lot of control, we start to see the appearance of the black holes and the sum over geometries. Uh, but we'd like to sort of extend this analysis to higher dimensions, and it's really not straightforward because we no longer have the tool of modular invariance. There's complications from including gauge fields, and as we'll see, there'll also be uh, sort of new ingredients within complex apps. So a lot of work has been done since 2016. So um, for four-dimensional gauge theory, uh, the partition function will, well, in general, partition functions will bring this. In general, the partition functions we've written as a sum over saddles uh, with some, uh, some dependence on the background potentials. Um, and as we vary these potentials, which could be the temperature or the chemical potentials, uh, the dominant saddle might change. So uh, in field theory, this exchange of saddles signifies a kind of phase transition. And in gravity, this is related to some nucleation or dominance of different kinds of black hole solutions. And we'll turn out to be in Euclidean signature, there'll be families of black hole solutions that might contribute. And this could lead to a complicated phase structure. So to understand, say, in 40 CFT, the meaning of this phase transition, we can think of this as being a simple version of the confinement deconfinement transition. So we can consider a polyacob loop that wraps the thermal circle. And this is dual 
to a world sheet in ADS. And in the background where we have black holes, uh, the uh, thermal circle becomes contractible here. Uh, and so we can find a cigar geometry. So the Wilson loop is like this boundary. We can find a cigar geometry that a world sheet can wrap, and that can give us a large action. And that tells us that um, we, when we have a black hole, we've entered the deconfined states. There's a large, large number of light states. So uh, we'll review the microscopic origin of the beckinsen hawking entropy for ADS5 and the counting problem. Uh, we'll review the, my work on the near BPS phase uh, from the bulk point of view, the sum over geometries, and the sort of role of this kind of saddle point analysis. Uh, and then finally, I'll discuss a paper to appear, which is um, where we will probe supersymmetric black holes with defects. So we'll consider other observables that can both detect this black hole phase transition, similar to this uh, picture of the cigar uh, on the previous slide. So we'll, we'll consider some generalization of this kind of observable, which serves as a probe of a black hole, and it will describe some supersymmetric black hole uh, interacting with some external system that also preserves supersymmetry, and we'll find a microscopic field theory door for that. And then there'll be some discussion. Okay, so the superconformal index of n equals four is super animal. So I said that we wanted to count some protected operators using a partition function with minus one to the f in it that will cause cancellations uh, essentially, so that uh, we're only counting these sort of short supersymm uh, supersymmetric multiplets and not generic long multiplets. So the shortening condition essentially will look for states that are annihilated by some supercharged Q and its adjoint Q dagger. And when we take the anti-commutator of these, this will be some sum of charges. So we're considering n equals four super Yang mills on S1 cross S3. Uh, and so this S3 will have two rotations, which will be J1 and J2 are the charges. And then because we have n equals four supersymmetry, there will be three R charges. So we're looking for states for which this combination of charges is zero, and these are the so-called 116 PPS states. They're the minimal ones, uh, minimal amount of supersymmetry possible to preserve. So the quantity we're looking at is the superconformal index, and this will be written as a trace over the Hilbert space on S3. And again, this minus one to the F, weighted with this E to the beta QQ dagger. So this combination of factors ensures that this quantity is protected, and we only get contributions from states where this combination is zero. So the beta dependence will end up dropping out here. We can compute this at weak coupling and extract it to a strong coupling. It's further refined by some degacities P and Q, and these will be related to chemical potentials, sigma and tau, uh, and they're related to, roughly speaking, the spins on S3. There are also some flavor uh, degacities that we won't use. Uh, so for our purposes, We'll understand that this superconformal index is enumerating operators for which this combination of charges is zero, and they're the ones that are annihilated by Q and Q dagger. And we can compute it at weak coupling, where the gauge theory description, in particular free gauge theory, is a good description. Uh, and then it can be extrapolated to strong coupling, where we believe the black holes should be a good description. So uh, there are numerous ways of, of trying to compute this thing as a trace. You can either enumerate states or you can use a path integral localization type argument. Um, and we'll use this sort of path integral approach. And so the standard idea, which maybe I won't have time to explain in detail, is that we have a, some, some fields that are n by n matrices. And so one way to build up gauge invariant uh, states uh, in this, um, in this uh, matrix integral is to start with some U1 free fields, just sort of enumerate all the basic uh, fields and their derivatives and compute some partition function or an index for these so-called single letters. And then the idea is that we'll take this operation called the plasticic exponential, combine the single letter index with some uh, SUN holonomies uh, or SUN matrices, and then this exponential automatically assembles, uh, automatically assembles um, uh, all the possible SUN words we can make, starting with the, the letters. And then finally, to get some, some to project to the gauge invariant states, we do an integral over the DUs. So you can think of this matrix integral over DUs as an integral of the holonomies of the gauge fields along the thermal circle. Okay, going to be fast, but yeah. Okay, so, so this is part of the reason for showing this formula is to tell you two things. First of all, we can start with the free gauge theory and build up the free abelian gauge theory and build up the non abelian result that contributes to this quantity. And also that the answer takes the form of some matrix interval. Now, if we take the specific example of n equals four super Yang mills and evaluate this plasticic exponential, 
uh, one can show that it'll be written as some now some integral over the ordinary SUN holonomies. We absorb some van der Bond determinant. Um, and then we have some product over I and J or SUN fundamental, uh, fundamental indices. We have some product over these elliptic gamma functions. So we'll have a large product of elliptic gamma functions. Their form is not really important for this talk. Just know that we can think of this thing here as being like the logarithm of the potential for some kind of matrix model. So they're very specific functions and their form uh, is determined by decomposing the n equals four vector multiplet into three chiral multiplets. So there's three in the numerator and one uh, vector multiplet in the denominator. So this result is known. Um, now, in the definition of the superconformal index on the previous slide, we only had a P, a Q, and these two uh, fugacities in terms of delta, sigma, and tau. But uh, it's convenient when we start thinking about the complex saddles of this matrix model that, the, uh, that we'll introduce a third delta. And what will happen is that when we constrain these chemical potentials, sigma, tau, and the three deltas, when we constrain them to be, have this particular combination to be equal to one, that will be equivalent to inserting minus one to the F in the partition function. So this is the supersymmetric condition. It plays an important role. But the problem uh, is that when we actually look at the black hole backgrounds, so thinking about the S1 cross S3 that sits at the boundary of ADS5 uh, as being some, some rotating metric, uh, when we go to the rotations, will give us off diagonal terms of the metric. And when we go to Euclidean signature, wherever we have a d tau or dt in the metric, we pick up an i dt. So these metrics, just by virtue of being in Euclidean signature, already have imaginary components. But the real key will be that when we try to, in the bulk, impose this supersymmetric relation, we'll find that we need to consider genuinely complex metrics. And this was the development, this was the result of. So, so essentially, if you only use a real saddle point for this matrix integral, as was done more or less in these early references, uh, uh, you won't find a large growth of this superconformal index that can be matched to the black hole entropy. You won't find it. So the developments in the more, more recent years, which has a huge number of authors at this point now, um, is that we should consider complex saddle points. So when we have complex chemical potentials, we'll be able to find a complex saddle point of this matrix integral. In particular, we're sort of analytically continuing the holonomies away from the region where they're usually defined. So we're doing an analytic <laughs> continuation on this matrix. Um, more boldly, this sounds a little bit like we're kind of analytically continuing the bulk path integral, although I won't exactly use that language. But essentially, it's natural and analytic to continue these eigenvalues, and it's natural here to consider complex metrics as well. So the result is that at the large end complex saddle point, we'll be able to write the action of the supergravity theory as this particular combination of uh, chemical potentials. It grows like n squared, and it's the same as the logarithm of this index is computed in the matrix. So, all right, so I need to go much faster, unfortunately, with the dots. Now, so this uh, quantity depends on the potentials, but not the temperature. Um, so it's independent of the temperature, but as we vary the potentials, it might be that you could find other saddles that uh, are subleading that can dominate this quantity. So some of these references study the different phases of n equals four super A mills uh, from this point of view. Okay, so to quickly uh, review the black hole solution that allows us to reproduce that argument, uh, we'll start with type 2b supergravity, and we'll consider a dimensional reduction on the S5, uh, where we've turned on background five form flux. So the type 2b supergravity action with this Kaluza Klein Hansatz leads us to a 5D uh, minimal gauge supergravity. And we'll really find black hole solutions in this theory that can be uplifted to the 10D one. So the black holes uh, metric has a, a topology that's essentially some kind of cigar. I won't necessarily take it to be extreme yet. It'll be some cigar and then some product of some S3 and S5 spheres. So this is the metric. We won't uh, dwell on it too long. But essentially, this uh, black hole metric generalizes the ADS Kerr Newman. It has four parameters, m, q, and two spins. Um, and so, of particular importance will be the electric potential, which is determined by smoothness, as well as the angular identifications, which are related to the rotations. And finally, the, uh, the value of the, uh, um, the location of the horizon is determined by the largest positive root uh, of delta r. So this metric is general. It's not necessarily supersymmetric. It's not necessarily extremal, um, but we'll take the supersymmetric limit in just a moment. So uh, what we can do is compute the on-shell action of this solution, including the various counter terms and boundary terms. And it can be written in a relatively simple form. 
Oh, uh, one thing I should mention as well is that all of the charges will go like n squared in this theory. So in particular, the entropy, the action will all go like n squared. That's the one over G5 here. Um, so this grand canonical uh, uh, action will satisfy this quantum statistical relation. This is the statement that the black hole thermodynamic formula works, identifying the on-shell action as a kind of free energy. Uh, and now we can impose the supersymmetric condition. So this is where the complex metrics come in. Uh, okay. So this is where the complex metrics come in. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, okay. <laughs> um, yeah. Okay. So, so the idea is that you know we have some generic m, q, a, and b describing some mass, charge, spin of the black hole. Now, when we go to Euclidean signature, it will turn out to be the case that the supersymmetric condition and the extremal condition are completely decoupled. So as I said, the index is independent of the temperature, right? So you might ask, why not compute it in the high temperature limit or the low temperature limit, where it might be easier to do that. From the bulk point of view, various quantities will end up diverging because there are factors of beta appearing everywhere. So in the low temperature limit, various quantities uh, will diverge. So rather than taking the extremal limit, we'll only impose supersymmetry. So when we impose supersymmetry and then solve for, say, uh, solve for n in terms of r plus using the location of the Euclidean horizon, we find that the charge q is complex. Now, you can see that the uh, r plus is the location of the horizon, and r star is the location of the extremal horizon. So the idea is that we have some complex metrics to sort of analytically continue our bulk calculation. Uh, but at the end, the physical black holes, the ones that end up not having closed time-like curves, are the ones for which r plus is equal to star, r star, namely the black hole is extreme. So if we impose only supersymmetry without extremality, we're sort of regulating the bulk problem, and then at the end, we might want to take the extremal limit to understand the entropy of the extremal black holes. And so finally, we can now relate the parameters of the gravity solution, omega-1, omega-2, and the electric potentials to the field theory quantities. And so the sigma, tau, and deltas that appeared in the superconformal index uh, are related in this way. So roughly speaking, the, you know, beta in the extremal limit where the black hole becomes a physical black hole, betas are all going to infinity, but then these potentials are, have to zoom in on their, uh, on their VPS values. Uh, and such that these limits became, become finite, and then these chemical potentials will be like order one numbers, order one half numbers. Nothing will be large. So we use supersymmetry to regulate the problem, and then we'll take extreme externality at the end. And if you follow this procedure, you can ultimately write the grand canonical action, which remember had a beta in front. We can ultimately write it as the simple combination of chemical potentials. Um, and if you remember from a couple of slides ago, uh, this was exactly the same as the uh, matrix model result. So the supergravity action with this particular complex uh, continuation reproduces the complex action of the matrix model. And again, if you, if you derive the entropy by some Lazarga transform from this guy and take the extremal limit, you get the ordinary legacy hockey entry. Yeah. A quick question. Is our delta, sigma, and tau complex? Yes. Yeah, they will be. They will be in general. On this, on, yeah. On this side, so 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 delta sigma and tau are generically complex, uh, but in the extremal limit, the these factors here will become real again and equal to their extremal values. So yeah, these guys will be complex, and uh, and uh, on the black hole saddle, uh, the black hole saddle point equations tell you that the eigenvalues are distributed with some function of these guys. So if these guys are complex, then the eigenvalue distribution is complex. So we really have analytically continued the matrix model computation. Okay. So um, I gave a talk, uh, I'm, I'm going toward uh, something I gave a talk about last year, and in the interest of time, maybe I'll, I'll be brief, but I just wanted to mention it because it served as some motivation for what's coming next. So there are different kinds of limits. I, I, I've emphasized that the index is independent of the temperature, but the bulk calculation looks a little bit singular at low temperature. So in a sort of high temperature limit, um, the matrix model simplifies, and this is dual to very large black holes that essentially fill all of ADS. Um, I won't say more about that, but it's a very interesting limit, especially because you can study finite n uh, corrections. Um, but in contrast, this low temperature beta going to infinity limit has subtleties in the bulk. As I said, lots of quantities diverge, and this essentially corresponds to the appearance of a long ADS throat in the geometry. So as we go close to extremality, the a long ADS2 throat uh, uh, develops, and we have to make sense of what happens to quantum fluctuations of the metric at low temperatures. So 
it's now known from studying models of ADS2 back reaction and holography that um, ADS2 holography has to work a little bit differently than the higher uh, dimensional versions. And that if you want to have any kind of interesting bulk dynamics, you have to take into account uh, the back reaction of the metric. And this is described by some version of JT gravity. Um, and uh, the advantage of JT gravity is that things like the partition function are exactly solvable. So the idea is that when we take the low temperature limit, this ADS2 throat develops, we then chop off this higher dimensional black hole geometry, zoom in on the ADS throat, and then do consider the quantum fluctuations of the metric uh, around this uh, ADS2 geometry. So um, this, is, this program has been uh, understood in um, largely for 2D black holes, but there's also work um, that uh, Luca and Joaquin and uh, myself have done now uh, for understanding it for higher dimensional black holes. And in some cases, you can think of turning on the small finite temperature as being some kind of a regulator. So I wanted to highlight uh, Luca and Joaquin's work with Samir Murthy, where they use this uh, low temperature JT description to um, reproduce the uh, index of n equals eight uh, black holes in n equals eight supergravity. And it was a useful approach to turn on finite temperature to regulate certain zero modes in the calculation. So um, the approach was that we essentially, uh, based on some previous work in flat space, uh, we understood these ADS5 process five black holes that I've described uh, in terms of um, in the near horizon region at low temperatures, there's essentially an N equals two super JT uh, gravity theory that describes the near horizon fluctuations in this black hole. And the, the super JT theory is equivalent to a supersymmetric Schwarzian theory. So uh, without going into details in the previous paper, we found that the partition function, at least at low temperatures, so I'm neglecting lots of the stuff I said at the beginning of the talk, logarithmic corrections, D brains, summing over more complicated geometries. But at low temperatures, our claim is that the partition function of these black holes has some description in terms of a sum over geometries with uh, some charges and chemical potentials. So these parameters are related to the ones I use to define the index. Now, each of these, uh, the partition function is a sum over saddles uh, with some e to the classical action. This S star is exactly the entropy we would have recovered from the index. Uh, or from the, uh, the supergravity calculation I described from higher dimensions. And these are low temperature corrections that are there uh, in the Schwarzschild theory. And we can't neglect them. These prefactors are one loop determinants of gravitinos and gauge fields, which again are describing fluctuations around each sat in two dimensions. So um, now what we can do is now that we computed the low temperature partition function without necessarily imposing the supersymmetric boundary conditions, we can now take the JT partition function and set the chemical potential equal to its BPS value. So I emphasize, well, I won't scroll back, but I emphasize this particular sum of the chemical potentials is equal to one or something like that. That was the condition for supersymmetry. If we, if we allow that sum to move a little bit away from one, then we need to consider a non-supersymmetric partition function, which is this box line. But when we set, say, in this language, this alpha potential equal to one half, we actually, this contribution from the sum over saddles disappears, and we recover the original index up to this oscillating factor, which I think there is some numerical evidence for this oscillating factor, uh, but it's purely a phase that tells you the bosons. And as we, as we vary some, some uh, charge of the states we're looking at, the index might alternate in sum. Um, so we can reproduce the index from this low temperature limit. And so what, what I described is that the JT gravity answer gives you some uh, uh, curve for the spectrum of BPS states. So there's a sort of non-BPS continuum. There's a gap scale that we computed. And then there's E to the S naught exact BPS states. And then S naught is what you, exactly what you would have computed from the matrix model approach. So this was in some sector of fixed charge where the, the R charge of the system was equal to the BPS charge. If we look at some non-supersymmetric black holes, there won't be this degeneracy anymore. Um, and my claim is that when we specify the chemical potentials to be the supersymmetric ones, all of these long multiplets, the non-BPS continuum disappears. And the only thing we're left with is the supersymmetric microstates, which can be counted reliably using that matrix interval. So I've been passing back and forth between the matrix integral formula and the black holes, and now this two-dimensional limit. And my, my claim is that at least when we uh, set up the calculation to count only the supersymmetric states, all of these approaches will agree. Now, 
it's difficult in general to produce this non-BPS continuum in field theory. So I said that we can match these extremal microstates and they're separated by some characteristic gap scale. So we think that these non-BPS states really should be there, uh, at least from a bulk argument, but we don't know how to see them directly in field theory. So we did some work on supersymmetric SYK models to try to study analog systems that have this kind of behavior. And these exhibit some rich class of phase transitions as well. So Joaquin talked about this uh, last year, so I won't focus on this. But I also wanted to highlight that we have some work in progress with Li Yifei Lu, a graduate student here, uh, on supersymmetry breaking. So what happens when you break supersymmetry? Can you resolve these individual microstates? Okay, so we'd like to now, in the second half of the talk, half, uh, we'd like to uh, go beyond counting, right? So what I basically what I said was there's several different ways to count the BPS microstates. They agree in field theory. They agree in various limits of gravity if you allow yourself these somewhat unusual complex cells. Um, but we'd like to know, do more than just count the black holes. So for instance, in this uh, near extremal limit, in the low temperature limit that I described, you can use correlation functions in super JT gravity or SYK um, to study sort of what these microstates look like. So by this, I mean, because there's a separation uh, in this plot between the BPS states and the non-BPS continuum, if we go through long enough times or low enough energies, various observables will only be sensitive to these kinds of uh, supersymmetric black holes. So even though they all are looked like they're degenerate zero energy states, we might be able to recover information about them by considering correlation functions in a particular limit. And that was the subject of this work. There are also, so in addition to sort of local operator insertions that we put at the boundary and, and fire into the bulk, we could also study non-local observables, such as, again, the boundary Wilson loop that I discussed in the context of confinement. And uh, these boundary Wilson loops are known to be dual to strings and brains in ADS5, which sort of extend from the bulk out and hit the boundary, and they hit the boundary along the, along the location of the loop. Um, and so some recent work was done in this direction uh, in this work. And so they were studying the half BPS Wilson loop via description of a, a string world sheet that sits in an ADS2 slice of ADS5. And they found some reparameterization mode and some hints of chaos. Um, but it's this physics here, even though it has some of the, the features of the black hole, and it's very interesting in its own right, uh, it doesn't directly describe the black holes that we want to study. So we want a non-local observable that probes these black holes. So that's uh, what I'll describe in the now, which is that we're going to consider a non-local gauge theory observable, and it preserves supersymmetry even on the 1 16th BPS background. So the partition function that I described so far preserved the minimum amount of supersymmetry possible. And in general, when you insert more operators, you'll break more supersymmetry. So we're going to find a non-local operator, which is compatible with the supersymmetry required. And this will be dual to some kind of brain that's interacting with the black hole. So this will be some model of a system where we have an exact microscopic field theory description of a supersymmetric black hole interacting with some externals. And this work is done with Yuming Chen, Yifan Wang, and Wenying Zheng. And, um, and uh, they are grad students here. And uh, Yuming and Wenying have done great work on this uh, as grad students at Princeton. So let me now highlight uh, what we've achieved. And um, this paper will appear soon. OK. So the idea is that rather than a Wilson loop, we'll consider sort of a Wilson surface. And in particular, um, this operator will end up still preserving the 1 16th supersymmetry. So this uh, operator it's specifically is called the gukov witten surface defect, and it has various different descriptions. So it's, it's a, it has a purely field theoretic definition as a sort of monodromy or disorder operator. So you can sort of specify boundary conditions of fields as you approach the defect, but, but that language won't necessarily be very useful for us today. So um, actually what we'll do is view this uh, field theory defect as coming from a string theory brain construction. So in particular, we could start with N D3 brains, which when we took the large N limit gave us ADS5 cross S5, but from the gauge theory description, this is N equals four superior mills. We can orient them along, say, the zero, one, two, three directions. And then we can take a single D3 brain and make this probe cut transverse to the stack. So you can see that the probe D3 brain intersects along the thermal direction, as well as the spatial cycle. So that the intersection of these two brains describes a surface. And then the probe sticks out along some certain directions in the bulk. So from the field theory point of view, there are now new open strings that stretch between the large stack of D brains and the new probe that we introduced. 
So there's now some additional, so in string theory, there are new open string degrees of freedom, which means in the field theory limit, there are uh, new matter degrees of freedom that live at this interface. So in field theory, we're now describing a coupled 2D, 4D system. And in particular, it will be a two-dimensional N equals four comma four supersymmetric 2ED. Um, and this theory will essentially have uh, N hypermultiplets and a U1 world volume gauge field. Importantly, the matter content of this 2D40 system is gauged by the 4D SUN fields. Okay, so a surface defect now, as I said, it wrapped it, it, well, in field theory, it wraps the surface. And on this S1 cross S3 background, the idea is that the defect will wrap a thermal circle as well as one of the angular directions on the S3. And it preserves uh, the 116 supersymmetry required. But additionally, and more importantly than that, it preserves supersymmetry. Because it extends along the time direction, it's changing the Hamiltonian of the theory, and it's changing the Hilbert space of the theory. So it now makes sense in the microscopic language to consider the space of local operators on the defect, and one can trace over this so-called defect Hilbert space. So skipping some uh, quite a number of details that argue that the string theory system, the field theory system, and this expression are all consistent, um, and that this 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 matrix integral form I've given is equivalent to taking a trace over the Hilbert space. Some of this stuff was established in these two references. Um, a SUSY localization argument will show that the defect index can be written as a matrix integral over SUN holonomies of the original 4D index. So previously, we didn't have this I2D, and I said that the super conformal index was just this quantity. Because we can compute things in the free limit, all we need to do all we need to do is consider this coupled 2D, 4D index. The only coupling between them is through their SUN holonomies. So one can show that in the confined phase, if you take this ordinary non-complex saddle point and evaluate this quantity, uh, the, the action of this, the action of the matrix integral at large n is shown to give zero. And our goal is now to apply this to the complex saddle point, which was necessary to recover the black hole entropy, and then give a dual uh, interpretation in terms of some brain probing the black hole. And any questions on this? I think I raced a little bit in order to get back up to speed. So yeah. So because you raced, I just want to ask a little bit about the surface operator. Yeah. So uh, the sigma model, the sorry, the gauge theory description you gave, uh, it's abelian gauge theory and hypermotor. Yeah, yeah. So so it's a since it's a single D brain, it's an abelian, there's an abelian gauge theory that lives there. So in, I'll I'll say the matter content in just a second, but it's basically uh, for in, in 2D n equals 2 language, it's one vector multiplet, one chiral multiplet, and uh, two n uh, chiral multiplets. So I'm decomposing the 2D 4 comma 4 theory into n equals 2 language, and then we'll, we'll write the index in terms of the n equals so 2. It's essentially like the P star PN, right? Put that in the middle of the Yeah, 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 that's right. But like, again, we, don't that, use that we don't use that description at all. Yeah. That confused me because I thought Luko Whitten defect is like the potential bundle of the flag, right? Sorry. <laughs> I, I, I think this the, the, this flows to a sigma model, which is the cotangent bundle CPN. Right, right. Uh, again, we, we don't use that description at all. We actually use the gauge linear sigma model description. And the reason is that that's how we know how to compute this sort of 2D, 4D uh, in the same way that we computed the black hole index. I mean, basically, we're redoing the calculation of the black hole saddle, but the, with the insertion of these new matter degrees of freedom that are gauged by the original saddle. So I'll also explain more about that in a second. But we ultimately use the gauge linear sigma model description. Maybe we can talk more afterwards. Um, I'm certainly not an expert on like the purely field theory description of these defects. Um, so what's going on in the bulk? So in the bulk theory, we have the decoupling limit of the brain construction. So um, essentially, when we go back and look at the brain diagram, when we take large n, the back reaction from the n d brains as opposed to the transverse probe. They collapse and give us some ADS5 cross S5, or these geometries that are asymptotically ADS5 cross S5. But uh, because there's a single probe now, uh, we'll end up with a D3 brain that sits in the bulk. Um, now, I said asymptotically ADS5 cross S5, because we already know that in some sense we're trying to approximate some gravitational partition function in ADS5 cross S5, at least in the semi classical limit. And we know that. Depending on how we tune the chemical potentials, the bulk might be dominated by the thermal ADS saddle, or it might be dominated by the black hole saddle. So 
when the background bulk fields are such that the black hole saddle dominates, the configuration we have is an extended version of the Wilson loop picture I gave at the beginning. The one that was at least sort of qualitatively used to define, uh, to, uh, um, to uh, detect the confinement deconfinement transition. Here, the probe D3 brain will have the following topology that we'll consider. So in two spatial directions, uh, it will wrap this Euclidean cigar. So it will wrap the part of the geometry, which will approach ADS2 in the physical limit. But right now, we're not taking the ADS2 limit. So this is just some kind of cigar shape. It will wrap one of the circles on the S3. So this circle and this circle give us the torus partition function of this boundary quantity. And then in the last direction will wrap one of the angles on S5. So this profile is chosen to solve the classical equations of motion and still preserve supersymmetry. So in order to compare the confined phase and the thermal phase, we'd like to compare the action of the brain between these two geometries. So uh, when the black hole phase dominates in the deconfined phase, we would hope and we expect to find ultimately that the defect will gain a large expectation value. Um, so at large enough n, it will turn out that we can neglect the back reaction on the bulk from the brain. So at large enough n, this will describe a supersymmetric black hole that's interacting with some probe quantum system. Thus, we're probing the supersymmetric black holes, and we should have some matrix model description. So I'm going to sketch the computation in the last however long I have. Um, all right, so let's start with the bulk, because it's actually, uh, this is a case where the quantum gravity and the bulk, in some sense, is easier than the field theory side. So the, the action of the D3 brain is proportional to its tension, but we'll use uh, the proper strain units appropriate for ADS5 cross S5, and we can ultimately say that the brain action is some Dirac born Infeld uh, 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 probe brain action where the coupling constant is order n. So remember that the 5D supergravity fields, they, their couplings were order n squared, whereas the probe goes only like order n. So this is subleading uh, compared to the black hole saddle. And it's the sum of two terms, the DBI term, as well as the uh, West Amino term, which is the pullback of the background bipolar. To preserve supersymmetry, it was also important to note that um, uh, to make the black hole solutions, we only ever turned on the five form. We didn't turn on any of the other NS or Ramon Ramon fields. So, so basically, both of these terms are going to be important. Um, and this uh, yeah, coupling is important for getting correct answers. So we can now, using that explicit metric that I gave some number of slides ago, we can evaluate the DBI term by pullback, uh, evaluating the determinant of the pullback metric. And it takes a, well, the metric is super complicated, but it actually, the DBI term takes ultimately a simple form. Uh, we can also use the, uh, evaluate the pullback uh, using a formula for C4, which I didn't explicitly write, but is implicit in what I uh, in my down to give us the field strength. And the pullback now, that's linear in Q, and this alpha is the electric potential. So I haven't necessarily taken the supersymmetric limit here, right? I'm, I'm in the pro bulk uh, approximation. I'm doing semi-classical physics. I just said that there exist solutions for Q, A, alpha, B, and M, and so on and so forth, where I can compute the brain action. So I haven't taken the supersymmetric limit yet, but we can now, again, still evaluate this action. So, so the, the integrating over the, uh, the sphere directions and leaving, well, integrating over the compact directions and leaving only the radial direction behind, remember the brain sits at the Euclidean horizon and stretches into the bulk. So technically, we integrate from the R plus, the location of the Euclidean horizon, all the way to uh, infinity, technically. But we, in order to get something finite, we'll need to put a regulator in. And it'll take a relatively simple form in terms of the basic parameters. Uh, I won't discuss it here, but with a bit more work and a change of coordinates, you can verify that the brain is uh, supersymmetric. It satisfies the Kappa symmetry projection condition. OK, so as I said, because the brain extends out to the boundary, we have a formally infinite action. But also, it is the case that the brain, in, in even in empty ADS, thermal ADS, had to be regulated as well. So the regularization that we'll use will be to subtract the brain action in the black hole background from the brain action in the thermal ADS background. The justification for this is that at large enough radial coordinate, the two metrics will agree. Um, yeah, so it's essentially the UV divergence that's common to both phases the defect. So this is our uh, subtraction procedure. So this is a version of holographic renormalization, so holographic subtraction. So 
Uh, what we do is we compare the defect action, which I re reproduced from the previous slide, and the action in just empty thermal ABS, which has a much more simpler, uh, much simpler diverge case. Now, I, I, I set the two radial cutoffs to be different, and indeed, they're not the same, because the idea is that in order to properly compare boundary, uh, pair the, compare the two geometries, we have to make them have the same boundary conditions. So the idea is that we need to make the induced meta, uh, metrics on the cutoff surfaces. Agree. Um, and so when we, uh, with a bit of calculation, in taking the large radius limit of the, uh, of the black hole metric and making it agree with the um, empty ADS metric, we find these relations between the cutoffs. And this relationship is exactly what's required to cancel the divergence into the three brain action. And this leads us to a finite result, which again, as written, is linear in the temperature and it's linear in that. Mm -hmm. That's the finite uh, piece. Um, depend on how precisely the subtraction is done. Hmm. Depend on how precisely. That, well, I don't think so. I mean, I mean, the point is that both of these things have the same divergence, and so when you make compare the metrics properly and subtract, that divergence cancels from the former quantity. So the divergence would cancel. But yeah. Yeah. No, I, I don't. I don't think. I don't think the finite piece is sensitive to the regulator at all. Um, I don't think so. There, there, there could be other subtraction schemes. So, so people who did the analog of this calculation just in thermal ADS, they also got zero, but there, there wasn't anything to subtract. So they had to go and look at the, the variational problem and basically add the boundary terms in order to get zero. But essentially, this, in this case, there's such a naive divergence here that the only thing it can be is zero once properly regulated. Another way of asking the question is, whether there exists a supersymmetric boundary term that's fine. Ah, yeah. So, yeah. So, um, I did look into this. Uh, I was not able to find a, a, a proper supersymmetric boundary term that does it. Um, that's not to say it doesn't exist. The, the existing proposals, like the boundary terms for the supersymmetric black holes, um, like Fasani and Martelli and people have worked on. Uh, it doesn't seem, it's rather complicated. It doesn't seem super well suited to this kind of problem. So this is kind of a naive subtraction that doesn't have anything to say about supersymmetry. I haven't even posed supersymmetry here yet. It might be possible that there's some correct supersymmetry boundary term that would make this a little bit more rigorous. But as is, this is uh, a practical thing that uh, works. And we'll see that we'll end up matching with the field um, I make a comment. So one sanity check of this is that the, the product beta and what's in the bracket, the total product is finite in the extreme limit. Oh yeah, I was going to get that. Goes to infinity and what's in the bracket goes to infinity. You yeah. have another finite term then that won't work. That's right. That's right. Yeah. So that that's that's sort of an independent check that yeah because as, as written this looks like it depends on beta but in a second I'll show that actually you can write in a way that's independent of beta and other things would not have that property. So, um, right, right, I'm doing that now. Right, so you have to recall that we had this supersymmetric black hole. So we're imposing the supersymmetry condition. And in the supersymmetry condition in this language amounted to having an imaginary part for Q in order to solve the, the, the BPS equation in terms of N, Q, A, and B. And furthermore, the various chemical potentials will also be complex. In particular, this alpha parameter, which was the electric, uh, electrostatic potential, is also complex. So once we impose the supersymmetry relations, we can write this uh, more complicated form, which is linear in N, and it has a beta, which is diverging, as Yuming was saying. And also, this factor in brackets is actually going to zero as beta goes to infinity. So when we restore our supersymmetric relation, the, in the end, we get something where we can take a finite limit, and we get a simple action, which goes like N times some rational function of the two angular potentials. So. Um, if I had an infinite capacity to scroll, I would click back 20 slides to the action of the black hole, and you would find that uh, you could write the, the original black hole action at the supersymmetric point as a similar rational combination of these functions. So what we found are some, some observable that has an order n uh, correction, and that, that is a, an order n correction on top of the black hole background that has a simple function in terms of the potentials. Now, one very surprising thing about this is that this is complex, even in the extremal limit. So I kept saying at the beginning that the, the black hole is complex, supersymmetry is a regulator. In the end, we'll get some real uh, action and real entropy out of that. 
Now, when we consider this defect in the black hole background, we find that even in the extremal limit, when the black hole becomes purely real, this defect has a complex action. So there's no contradiction because we're computing a Euclidean semi-classical uh, Euclidean quantity, and there are actually there are other brain type solutions which you can which give corrections to the n equals four index that will have a similar kind of structure. So this is not in contradiction to things I've already said, but it's certainly a puzzle that we'd like to understand better. So maybe towards the end we can discuss if there's any time for discussion. Sorry, but this is yeah. computing an index, right? So it's supposed to be yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I mean, every an integer. Well, this is the, this is this is you know this is e e to the f right so well the the, the index is like e to this value right so the the same would be true of the the, the field theory of quantity right we, we, you know the index will be e to this complex function um, maybe I should emphasize that this had nothing to do with necessarily to do with quantum gravity or or something mysterious happening in the bulk, because as I'll show, we get the exact same thing in field theory. So the point is that there's a field theory observable where you basically put the field theory on some complex background and compute the partition function at large n, and you will get this complex answer. I mean, you use complex potentials, you will find a complex saddle, and the action of the matrix model will end up being complex. But when, when you put it in the final answer, do you get other solutions with, with the others? Complex function. Uh, yeah, I didn't even talk about this, but all, all of these things come with complex conjugated pairs. So if there's uh, some prescription where we need to add up uh, complex conjugate solutions, then you can get something that's pure real if you like. Yeah. So that probably would have been uh, um, basically throughout most of this talk, we can put a plus or minus one here, and these will describe two sheets of the index. So the index is some multi valued function, and there are different branches that will like sheets, and they'll, that will cause. Various quantities to come with complex conjugate pairs. Yeah. Is the real part of the action complex? The real, yeah. So, so I plotted the real, my, uh, the real and imaginary parts here. Oh, okay. so yeah. So the imaginary part dips a little bit negative. So this a. So yeah. So here we we specified some 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 particular. Uh, you know, j two is equal to two j one or something like that. Just to, to simplify this, and then plotted the action and yeah, the real and imaginary parts of the action. And when the when the spin when the black hole spins down to zero, this is like the limit where the thermal ADS phase shows up again. It's like a formally small limit, and the black hole uh, the action diverges as the spin parameter approaches one. So you're you're getting to the case where you're over rotating the black hole, but the real part is is positive as you can see. The real part Yeah, the real part never. Hmm? That's minus real. Oh yeah, sorry, minus the real part. Yeah. But then isn't like you don't don't. Don't you get a divergent uh, partition function if it's if the real part is negative? Or, I, I'm just saying no. that you put you to the minus i is. Uh, I think this depends on where you're putting the minus sign. So I, this this is a plot of minus the real part. Uh, the problem that it grows, right? It's just a large entropy. It's a large entropy. It grows in order n, but it's not. It doesn't blow up in right. It blows, the only place it actually blows up is when you try to over rotate the black hole, but then you would have a naked singularity anyway. Yeah. So, so, like this right so. yeah. I wanted to ask about is this the run ensemble? Maybe you need to look at it in terms of charges, and then there's some Legendre transform. Yeah. I hope it can be real, no? Yeah, yeah. So this, this is where we we have in mind probably studying this in some, some future direction, essentially studying the the thermodynamics of the deep brain in some more general ensemble. So, I mean, yeah, we chose some, some particular complex ensemble to compute the index, uh, but that's not the, the only choice. And basically, if we had a more general study of the thermodynamics of this object, um, um, it might be that, you know, fixing the right charges and doing appropriate Legendre transformation, we could get something more physical. That's actually, yeah, exactly what we uh, were thinking of. As a student follow. So I was going to leave some of that for discussion, but maybe it was uh, important to uh, get that out there now. Okay. So uh, it's going to be hard to get through the field theory, but it, okay, there were some interruptions. Um, but I will. I will have to be brief. It, to, to be honest, uh, I was already planning on being a little bit brief because the field theory computation is actually very challenging in comparison to the gravity discussion I've given so far. Um, 
I think it would maybe be worth a whole other talk. I don't know. Uh, but so for now, I'll basically give just a sketch. All right. So my claim was that from the field theory side, this defect index was just the matrix integral of this, the 4D index and the 2D index. Now, the idea is that if you rewrite this whole thing as some matrix potential, you would find that the 4D index grows like order n squared, and the, D, the 2D index grows like order n. So at large enough n, there's no back reaction on the matrix model potential from the 2D side. So the idea is at large n, we use the saddle points of the original 4D problem and feed them into the 2D problem in order to extract the 2D answer and try to compare with what we got from that. So this is sort of dual to the statement that we were only concerning a probe grain in the bulk. So the bulk didn't back react on the metric. And in the field theory side, what I'm saying is that the matrix potential doesn't back react from the insertion of the surface defect. So this is the approximation we'll use, and it will turn out to be a good one. So then we will evaluate by large end saddle point. We'll write the index as a sum over saddles, of the I4D, I2D, and then we can essentially cancel off by normalization the 4D part and extract the 2D growth. Okay. All right, so here we go. This is why this would never have been good as a chalkboard talk. So, so let's think of this uh, um, 2D index as a cartoon. So as I was describing before, uh, so the 2D theory will have a abelian chiral multiplet and an abelian vector multiplet, as well as two uh, chiral multiplets in the fundamental representation. So the 2D index, by the same kind of single letter counting I outlined in the beginning. So this factor comes from the vector multiplet in terms of this Jacobi Q uh, elliptic theta function, sorry, Jacobi Q theta function, um, which has a definition in terms of these pop camera symbols, which also has a definition in terms of a plastic exponential, and it has a nice quasi-periodicity property we'll use in a moment. So this is the, the 2D index of a vector multiplet. Here's the 2D index of a chiral multiplet. And then each of these factors are 2D indices of these uh, fundamental chirals. So the point is that the first line, and, and, and eta is integrating over the holonomy of the 2D gauge field. So if we wanted, we could mostly just drop the first line. And if we were only interested in the large end entropy, we could drop the first line because the end fields here provide the dominant contribution. Um, but if we ask some more subtle questions, like does this theory have the right spectrum of charges, the right periodicity potentials, uh, then this, uh, uh, we would need to include this line. Actually, including this line makes it much more uh, complicated. Um, but yeah, you, you actually will get essentially the right answer by keeping this up. So the idea is that we would like to take these, this combination of theta functions and, uh, and write it as e to the log of something. So we want to be able to take logs of theta functions. In order to take logs of theta functions, because they have, as I said, a plastic exponential representation, uh, we want the plastic exponential to converge. And you see that the theta functions are evaluated in some complex uh, sums of chemical potentials, and those chemical potentials are complex in general. So we want the, the plastic exponentials to converge, and this will end up putting some restrictions on our starting point. So in the region where we had real holonomies, we want the plastic exponentials to converge, and then we analytically continue away from real holonomies. Um, okay, just as a technical point, we do the integral over the gauge holonomies, and we can write this index as a sum over products. You can check that in the thermal ADS saddle, this uh, the logarithm of the index is zero, which agrees with the gravity calculation. So now we need to check what it is in the uh, in the H theory. Uh, sorry, in the black hole saddle. So this one is a lot more complicated. And actually, for the range of chemical potentials where plastic exponential was convergent, uh, these were sort of when sigma is not equal to tau. And even in the original 4D matrix model. Uh, it took some time for people to find the correct saddle points. Uh, and about a year ago, this paper appeared, um, which shows that the idea is that the eigenvalues are no longer distributed at some distribution along the real line, but the correct matrix model saddle, again, this is from the 4D problem that we're using as an input to the 2D problem, the eigenvalues are distributed uniformly over some parallelogram, so some parallelogram eigenvalue on size. And in general, so this is in the complex plane. So this is a complex eigenvalue distribution. So the idea is that after taking the logarithm of the 2D integrand, we'll place sums over these eigenvalues distributed uniformly over the plane with some double integral. So 
after a bit more work, I'm, I'm ignoring, there's, there's an additional complication because actually the gauge theory, uh, the gauge theory answer requires us to sum over products and we can't naively take the log. Uh, so let me just say that for now, we'll, we'll imagine that we've dropped the, uh, we, we dropped the contribution from the gauge field simply so I can ignore talking about the additional technical difficulty when that's included. So for now we can forget about this extremization over this additional parameter. So there's one more integral that needs to be evaluated. And as I said, you know, we want to take logs of these theta functions. In order to take logs of theta functions, we want to write them as PEs. The PEs were converging for real cells, but they won't always converge for complex cells. And actually, as we integrate over this parallelogram distribution, the plasticic exponential will fail to converge at particular points in the integration domain. The trick will be that whenever we cross one of these branches, like I just crossed across the screen, whenever we cross one of these branches, we want to use this formula, the quasi-periodicity, to shift the argument of the theta function back into the physical region where the PE converges at the cost of introducing an additional phase. So the idea is that we break up this integral from 0 to 1, 0 to 1, over a sum of integrals, where in each piece we piecewise patch together the theta functions at the cost of introducing phases. All of this is important for getting a consistent answer. And in the end of this long procedure, we will eventually find by doing the integrals of these elementary phases, doing the integrals of the logarithms of the plasticity exponentials, and then this extremization, which I didn't have time to discuss, we finally reproduce the exact answer that we got in gravity. And it's complex, again. It's complex in field theory. Everything from the last few slides could have been phrased without ever knowing anything about the bulk system. And so questions about the thermodynamics of the defect continue to apply here. The answer seems to be simpler than the explanation, right? Yeah, it's funny how that works, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, I, I, you know, black holes as, as ordinary quantum systems, right? But nobody told you that the, the description of the quantum system had to be simple, right? I mean, let me emphasize, right? Yeah, it was, it, was a, it was a lot of work to get here, right? And the final answer is so simple. If anything, okay, maybe there were some subtleties in the gravity calculation, but somehow like the gravity language is nicer than the field theory language. But the miracle is that, you know, for these kinds, certain kinds of quantities, we can achieve an exact match. And so we ultimately know that there is some, some microscopic, no, again, this was the large N answer, right? But we could have, we could have gone back a couple slides and written down some formula that's in principle an exact answer, even at finite n. Um, yeah, so this gives us some potential for the large n answer is simple. The finite n answer looks complicated, but that's the idea, right? You know, a black hole might be an ordinary quantum system, but it might be a very complicated quantum system. And in this case, it's a black hole interacting with an external system. So it's beyond just some counting black hole degrees of freedom. We're counting degrees of freedom of a couple system. Okay, so some puzzles, we actually already kind of discussed this and I'm now going a little bit over time. So as I said, the Euclidean action is complex, even in the extremal limit, uh, leads to a complex entropy. It's difficult to reproduce with the ADS2 technology I talked about before. If you remember carefully what I said, when we took the low temperature limit and used the JT gravity description of the black hole, we ended up only getting the real entropy back. Uh, and if you try to repeat some of this, at least tentatively, um, you seem to run into problems getting this complex entry. So maybe you need to use some more near extreme uh, description. Um, we also don't have a particularly good Lorentzian interpretation of the defect. So the defect does go behind the horizon in the uh, Lorentzian signature. Um, but our calculation seems to be insensitive to it. We, we only insensitive to this. So we only do the, the calculation where the, the defect basically wraps the uh, Euclidean cigar. But so it's, it's not clear exactly what the defect sees uh, in the interior, possibly, possibly nothing. Actually, this is something I'd, I'd like to discuss after the talk, because um, I don't want to say something strange about stuff going behind the horizon necessarily. Um, but definitely, uh, as Leo was suggesting, uh, our plan is to do some more detailed uh, check of the thermodynamics, possibly uh, picking a different ensemble where we're not necessarily forcing ourselves into these complex geometries right from the beginning. It might be that there's a, a better uh, ensemble with the right Legendre transform. We can give a more physical interpretation and extract the actual entropy. Um, and the final puzzle is that at finite n, we still have an exact result. Um, it suggests the possibility of some kind of finite n holography for black holes coupled to other systems. 
Um, so ignoring the, the ensemble of business, roughly speaking, there's an S total, which is S black hole plus S D3. This is good in the probe approximation. D3 was a little bit complex, but subleading in N. And again, there may be a better choice of ensemble where this formula is more clear. But at finite N in field theory, there's not really a clear separation between the, 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 back, the, the, the 2D index and the 4D fields, right? I said that, that the reason why we were able to use the 4D saddle point is we, because we were working at large N. But if we worked at finite N, then the matrix potential will gain contributions from the 2D fields, and we would need to find a genuinely new saddle between them. So I guess what I'm saying is that as we turn on finite end corrections, there's not really a clear separation. The brain and black hole react, and this might somehow be connected to ideas about generalized entropy in finite end systems. We have a black hole interacting with some matter system at finite end. Uh, so maybe some of these works will have something to say about that or vice versa in this, uh, in this kind of context. Uh, the reason why I mentioned this is because, again, this is some observable where you 100% know that it is well-defined at finite end in the field theory side. So maybe that will work. This will also happen if you put too many of these defects. Exactly. So another, another simple extension is that I said it was a single probe brain, but in general, you could have K D brains, and you could have a stack of large N D brains and a stack of K. And as you start increasing the probe, you, you will inevitably have to consider the, the back reaction in this problem. So that's a, that's a generalization that, that um, one could contemplate. Yeah. Sorry, this comment about generalized entropy, you brought it up because. I mean, generalized entropy in the sense that the quantum fields in the bulk would give a, an important contribution. Or, or yeah, yeah. Well, well. I, I guess, I guess, roughly, what I'm saying is that that at least starting from this probe approximation, the D3 brain is some some matter system living on top of the black hole, and it has its own entropy, right? But its entropy is, is not uh, obvious in the bulk. I mean, it, it doesn't come from the fields that live in this D3 brain or anything. It just uh, yeah, it's as mysterious as the Bekenstein copy entropy. Yeah, yeah. I suppose in in, in that sense, the, the yeah, from what I've described so far, it's just that the, the action of the of the brain has this large value. So yeah, in that sense, it's it's, it's as mysterious as Bekenstein talking. But then again, we have some microscopic description that might give more meaning to that. Yeah, that, I agree. This, this this connection is 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 maybe a bit tenuous, but it's it's in the same flavor. Yeah. Um. Okay, so now I'm concluding, having gone not too long over time. Um, so sort of what I've said to summarize is that so string theory predicts that quantum gravity, gravity does have some microscopic, microscopic description. We just don't know all the rules. Um, and we see that these supersymmetric black holes are nice laboratories for testing ideas about microstates and quantum gravity because we know there's a completely ordinary large N quantum system that, uh, that is normal to that. Um, and as I've discussed, you know, in order to get the answers that we got, we had to do quite a number of, you know, less than conservative things in the bulk, like summing over geometries, including families of Euclidean solutions, fluctuating boundary modes, complex metrics, and also stringy defects. So we had to include all of these kinds of effects. And they reflect some, some the fact that the field theories describing gravitational systems are just extremely complicated and have extremely rich physics in their own way. And finally, as I've emphasized now, the surface defect is, seems to be an example of a quantum system which has an exact field theory dual, preserves supersymmetry, and describes some kind of black hole interacting with the, with the quantum system. Um, okay, so future directions, we could discuss, as I said, the, the physical thermodynamics of the defect, um, we could extend this to other kinds of operators. So go back to the original Wilson loop or consider generalizations of the Wilson loop uh, or other theories. And then there's a brief relationship to giant gravitons, which is also about counting D3 brain states in the whole. I won't say any more about that right now. So um, with that, uh, again, you know, uh, thank you guys for your uh, collaborations and our uh, discussions over the years. And our, um, you know, it's, uh, this was a, a very challenging time, uh, you know, but it's it's really an honor to be here and to have the uh, uh, opportunity to be at the IAS. Uh, this is like clearly one of the most fantastic places to be doing theoretical physics. Um, so I really uh, appreciate the opportunity I had. Thank you. Uh, questions? Yeah.
there um, other examples of CFT observables that describe black holes coupled to matter systems or black holes coupled to something? Yeah, different? so I, I didn't want to I didn't want to commit to so obviously you can start with some supersymmetric background and then put other stuff on top of it. Um, but it's not always the case that it, you can find uh, an observable that once inserted still preserves all the original supersymmetry you wanted to. This is, seems to be one example. There might be other examples. Like I was kind of asking around actually for people to give me other examples. Um, maybe we can we can discuss, but but uh, certain correlation functions will typically break some amount of the supersymmetry. Even the Wilson loop, the ordinary Wilson loop, if you try to put it on this S3 background, that won't preserve the 116 supersymmetry. So so uh, I think you know maybe one example was like say these multi-center black holes where you have one black hole. This would be in flat space, for instance. But like one black hole is very big, the other black hole is very small, and that black hole looks like a probe, like a, some probe particle in the black hole background. That's not an ADS example, though. I mean, I, I'm happy for someone to suggest. Are, are there other examples where there's some observable that preserves SUSY? I, I, I don't want to say this is the first one or anything like that. That, that would be kind of crazy. I did have trouble finding good examples. So, can you change the defect field? Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah, so that that would fall somewhere under this extension to other operators. So, so the ordinary Wilson loop doesn't doesn't uh, seem to preserve Suzy. At least we had trouble getting that to work. It might be that there's some variant of the Wilson loop, or for instance, there there are there are less supersymmetric theories. Like instead of n equals four superadding moles, you could consider some general for n equals one as CFT, and then there are zero two defects. I believe that that one might be able to apply the same techniques. The, the black hole solutions are known. They're described by this Bukowski real black hole solution in ADS-5 across the sasaki einstein five hole. So that would be straightforward. And then, then you could start checking dualities with supersymmetry defects, both dualities between field theories and then dualities between the dual black holes. I think that's something that, that uh, would be would make sense. I think for the chemical potentials, you can put on the defect that do not come from the black hole. Yeah, yeah. So I actually uh, deliberately avoided saying too much about the surface defect, but there are additional four real parameters you can turn on that describe the electric and magnetic polonomies from the bulk E three frame point of view. There's the electric and and uh, yeah magnetic uh, uh, Wilson lines that you can turn on in the bulk. And then there's two additional scalar like parameters or a complex scalar parameter. We set all of those to zero, but there are refinements by turning them on. And in the bulk, what will happen is that you'll start bending the brain as you turn these parameters on. And so this would be some uh, additional refinement. And it might be that the, the it's more complicated when you turn these on because the brain bending and thermal ADS is sort of easy to see, but on this complicated background, it's a lot less clear. Uh, uh, if you can even find a bending brain solution that describes these things. So, so as you turn on these additional refinements, you might get something completely different. Yeah, that's right, that's right. Uh, other questions? All right, maybe. Let's uh, thank Matt again for the